here. Okay, so we're recording now. Uh, by the way, the recording uh, situation here is that I'm sharing a, uh, sharing a router with my daughter who lives next door. She is teaching online kindergarten by Zoom, if you can imagine doing such a thing. Uh, so, uh, so we have an agreement that we don't have a DSL connection. So when you do upload on DSL, like if I upload this lecture to, uh, to YouTube, it sucks away like all of the download capabilities and it takes away the whole internet to do an upload. So we, we, uh, we um, have an agreement that we only do uploads late at night or early in the morning. And so, so I don't, that's why it takes me a while to get these uh, to get these videos like uploaded. I have to wait for a time when I'm up at that hour for one thing. So, so uh, at any rate, so I'm recording this and uh, let's um, do a share screen. So, uh, so uh, here on uh, the assignments page, I have posted. Uh, there's this team participation survey. Hopefully, people have seen that. I've taken done that. Uh, taken. I posted echo, and echo is due May first. Okay, and and the echo assignments. Let's look at assignments for a moment. Here's echo. So this is what we're we've been talking about. And if you scroll down to the bottom, there. Lab one, um, your lab two, you're doing the math handler. There's uh, lab three, we're doing proxy handlers. Lab four, uh, cash proxy. Lab five, security proxy. Lab six, exchanging objects. So I want you to do labs one through five. So all of those features should be included in um, in the framework uh, that you're doing. This lab six exchanging objects is not hard to do. In fact, uh, we've even given you some, looks like I've given you some code here. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, I'll either do that or, or, you know, if you wanted to incorporate that into lab one, uh, if you, you know, Board and interested in doing some, you know, finding out more about this stuff. It just makes your framework a little bit more usable. Instead of client and server exchanging strings back and forth, they can exchange arbitrary objects back and forth. Anyway, so that's not required. But lab one through five, I do want you to do all of those, uh, all of those features. Okay, so uh, that's due May 1st. Oh, let's see. And then there's this other assignment, pods here, which is worth 5%. Um, I'm not exactly sure I want to handle this. I think what I'd like to do, it says team project. I think what I might do is pair you up or maybe just make it an individual project. I think uh, pairs, pairs works like if you're sitting in a classroom next to somebody, pairs programming, but but it's kind of a hassle if you're doing it online. So this will be an individual project and we'll probably do this together in class. Um, maybe if you're just doing a little touch up work at home on this, or maybe we'll just forget about it all together, in which case I'll have to like figure out some way to redistribute this 5% of your grade. So, uh, so uh, I'm thinking about that, but meanwhile, Echo is gonna be due on May 1st, okay? And where are we in our schedule? We are, let's see, today I think is April 21st. So we're down here in week 13, talking about client server architecture. Um, and then, um, and then um, we start to get into last week of April. Okay, so yeah, we're about right on schedule here. Um, Follow the lectures link down here to distributed architectures. So remember, just to get your minds back from you know, the weekend. Uh, these are the three main types of uh, client server architectures, pipeline, client, I'm sorry, start over, I said that wrong. 
these are the main types of distributed architecture. Distributed architecture is an architecture for a program that has components running on different computers connected, you know, by say an internet connection. So pipeline architectures, that's kind of the oldest. Client server architectures, the next oldest, and then peer-to-peer -peer architectures, which is really just uh, kind of like our agent-based architecture that we've talked about. And so we uh, are delving into doing a deep dive into client server architectures. The way we're doing that is um, we're learning about it through this, this echo uh, framework that we're building. Okay, and let's just talk about that for a second, just to remind you how that works. Here is a UML sequence diagram. Uh, and it shows sequence diagrams show, uh, show interactions between objects. Up here we have simple client, and that little box behind it means that simple client is a multi instance. So there could be many simple clients. Okay? Uh, REPL here is its read execute print loop. So this yellow bar is the running of the read execute print loop in here. This black bar here is just a uh, something I invented to, uh, to show that um, to, this is a, what I call a process boundary, okay? meaning that simple client is running in a different process than the server and request handler over here. Okay? Uh, uh, these processes might be processes running on the same computer or processes running on different computers uh, connected by a network of some sort. Yeah, it doesn't really it doesn't really matter for our framework. Okay, so when the client comes online, he requests a connection from the server. Well, the server has got this listen loop that it's running. So that's this yellow bar. Server's listening for these requests. When he gets a request, he creates a request handler object. Okay, and then notice that all interactions now are between simple client and request handler. The server is out of the picture now because it goes back to listening for more uh, incoming requests. Okay. Here is part of the design um, there. Uh, I introduced, I gave you the code for this correspondent class. Correspondent has the ability to send a string and to receive a string. Okay, in that lab six that we were talking about, the difference there is that instead of string, these are objects, or I guess they're messages, but message is just, a, it's just an interface, an MD interface or something, but these could just be objects. They don't have to be strings, okay? Simple client, simple client and request handler are both inherit send and receive. They both inherit from correspondent. So simple client request handler, they are correspondence and they correspond with each other. Okay. Um, request handler uh, implements the, well, let me come back to this. How are send and receive implemented? The way that they're implemented is the correspondent, remember this is our has a arrow, has a socket. Socket is something that comes from the operating system, and I asked you to think of a socket as essentially a virtual telephone. Okay, so, so send connects to the transmitter of this telephone, and receive connects to the receiver of this phone. So simple client will inherit a socket, and request handler will inherit a socket, and these sockets are connected to each other, kind of like that if this is the, right, here's one phone, here's the other phone, flip it over and connect them like that. Okay, and the operating system does all of that for you. It's part of the internet protocol, um, internet uh, protocol stack for, um, for the internet. Uh, so, uh, so that's how send and receive uh, work. Now request handler implements the runnable interface because we saw before the uh, this is the master-slave architecture here. The server is the master and these request handlers, notice that's a multi-instance too. There are potentially hundreds of these request handlers 
talking to hundreds of different clients matched up with them, right? Uh, and, and also, by the way, notice that this is a stateful um, service, a protocol that we're running because the messages just go back and forth until he gets a quit message and now the conversation ends. But this server is the master and he's creating the slaves. So the slaves are threads, they're runnable. That means you have to have a run method. And what's the run method do? Well, he's gonna, uh, he's gonna receive a request from the client and then he passes that request to the response method, which returns a response. And then he calls send and sends the response back to the client. Okay, and the way that uh, response is implemented in the request handler is very lame. It just echoes the request back again. It prepends the word echo to it and sends it back. But that lameness is fine because if it's too lame for you, like if you wanted to do something fancier, well, you subclass request handler and you override response to do something more interesting. Here is the code that I've given for you. Now, this code, I think, correspondent and simple client are complete. Right? Uh, and then here's request handler. Here is the response, the lame response, return echo, whatever you told me. Okay, and here's the run loop. Notice it's an infinite loop, or we could say perpetual loop uh, while true. So it's going to be running uh, and all of the commented out parts here are parts that you have to fill in. So I'm going to call my inherited receive message to find out what the client wants. If that is quit, this is how I get out of the infinite loop. I call break and we're out of the loop. Okay, uh, and we'll never get to this next line then. Otherwise though, uh, I'm going to come up here and call response, okay, get like a response, and then send it back to the client. And then because I'm a slave uh, thread, I need to be cooperative. So I'll either sleep for a few milliseconds or I will call yield, thread.yield also works here. And then when we're done with our conversation, I will close. I think close is also comes from the correspondent class. Um, we have to create a variable request. Well, uh, not necessarily. I mean, it's, uh, it's a string. Um, not necessarily, right? I mean, you could just say send response, um, this method response. I mean, you can decide how you want to handle that. Um, so uh, you need to finish that code. Here, um, and but these things should work fine. Those things should be complete. And then the only other part of at least the, what did we talk about here? Lab one of the project is the server. That has to be implemented. Okay, and the server, remember, he has a server socket. Server socket is the uh, internet equivalent of a switchboard. So this is like this little picture, I like this picture. Um, this, is the, uh, this is the server right here, right? The switchboard operator. Um, so gets an incoming call and then connects that call to you know, some sort of like a claims handler, whatever the company is. You know? And so then, so then that rings the phone on the claims handler's uh, desk. And now the caller is talking to the, to the claims handler and, and she goes back to listening for more incoming calls. So this switchboard back here is the server socket and the switchboard operator here, that's the, the server. I, know, I like that picture. So. Um, and I think if we come down here, uh, way down here, server.java, Let's take a look at that. I've given you a lot of code here to get started. So here is the server class and here's the server socket, my socket. So that's the switchboard, okay? And, uh, and uh, here, um, here is the port. So remember uh, the port is like the phone number. So my port up here. 
this is like the phone number uh, of this particular uh, this particular operator, this server. Um, every every operating system basically has about sixty five thousand port numbers, and uh, you know that you can ask to be have connected to you. So this is whatever port that you're going to offer your service at. Here's the listen method, and again, these commented outlines are stuff that you have to implement. For example, accept a connection, okay? That calls, I think my socket, server socket has an accept method on it. And, and what happens is that if there are no incoming requests, it just blocks. You're suspended until one comes in. Uh, and then when one comes in, this creates a socket that you can then hand off to the handler. Okay, so, so it's a little bit like our switchboard operator here, but imagine that when the call comes in, she doesn't simply, let's picture again. Okay. She doesn't simply connect you to a phone on somebody's desk. She actually manufactures that phone and hands it to the guy and then connects you to that phone. Okay, so uh, now normally if this were a server like the web server for, uh, you know, for Google, let's say, there are a million requests coming in every second, right? And so every time we get to this line here, we just grab the next uh, client off that list and, and make a handler for that client to talk to. And then uh, remember the handler has a start method. It's uh, that's in the interface, right about that. Start, or do we just call run? Hmm, can't remember. Either call start or run here, right? And then that handler is off running, talking to that client. And we zip back up here to the next line. And if this is Google, Right, there's somebody, a client already waiting. They're already, you know, wrapping their fingers on the table impatiently. So we grab that guy and go through the loop again. So we're just constantly in this loop going around this loop. For our server, which won't be quite as popular as Google's, you know, uh, we're probably going to end up blocking here, waiting until you, know, you start up another simple client and send a request. So he's usually blocked in this case. Okay. Um, so, so hopefully, um, hopefully all of that is clear to everybody. Um, <clears throat> what I want to focus on here is this next step, make the handler. So I have to make a request handler and I've given you some sketch of the code that has to happen. I've got to um, make a request handler here. And, uh, and so that's what today's lecture is about. And there are a couple of strategies for how we could do this. For example, um, let's say that you wanted to provide some kind of like an internet game server, like tic-tac-toe, let's say. What would you need to do? Uh, if you're going to use our framework. Well, um, up here, you'd need to create like a game handler and override response so that it would, you know, find out where did you put the X and then it returns where it's going to put the O and you know, probably keep track of it, have like a little data structure representing the tic-tac-toe board, and where the X's were, where the O's were what strategy to use, blah, blah, blah. So you'd have to create the game handler class. Okay, and then the other thing that you would do is you'd have to create a game server, which subclasses the server. And the game server would override make handler. So when a request came in, we assume it's a request for playing tic-tac-toe, he's going to return not a not a generic request handler, but a game handler. Over here, you'd have to create, if you were interested in providing a service for you know, doing you know, math problems, 
right? You would uh, have to create a math handler subclass of request handler and a math server subclass of server and make handler there would return a math handler. Okay, so that would be one way to do it. Here's another way to do it, abstract factory. So give the server a pointer to a, an abstract handler factory or a handler, handler factory interface with an abstract make handler method in it. And then um, here we have game handler factory would implement this interface by implementing make handler to return a game handler. Over here, we're implementing game handler to return a database handler and so forth. Okay, so those would be two approaches to you know, how we could do this. But uh, as I have said a bunch of times to you, and I hope that this, that this is making an impression, a, um, a framework, uh, the popularity of framework is proportional to, um, is inversely proportional to how hard it is to customize that framework. Okay, and, and one way of measuring how hard it is, is like, well, how many classes do you have to create? Um, let's make this more concrete. Let's say that we decide as a class to form a little company and, um, and sell the frameworks that we've been developing to, uh, you know, to other companies, okay? And, uh, and so, you know, let's say there's some guy out there that's interested, has like some kind of a game that he'd like to develop, and he's considering buying our Echo framework from us um, in order to, uh, in order to implement uh, his game, right? So, so he asks our salesman, well, you know, okay, so I'm gonna buy Echo Framework from you. How hard is it to customize this thing, right? And, and, and our salesman, you know, is gonna say, well, okay, so, you know, for example, if you wanted to do like a math framework, and that's maybe the salesman's standard pitch, You'd have to create this math handler class, and this guy's making a game. You'd have to create a game handler, subclass of request handler, figure out this response method, which only you know about since you invented, you the customer invented this game. So we can't do that for you. And then in addition, you're gonna have to either make a game server class or a game handler factory. So two things that you're gonna have to build. Right, and here's what I'm concerned about, that this customer is gonna say, ooh, two things, that's a lot of things to build. And I don't really understand this anyway, right? A handler factory, I'm just like a game guy, right? I don't know anything about factories here, what that is, or servers. I thought you were giving me the server. What are you saying that I have to create a server? If I have to create a server, why do I need you at all? So, you know, uh, as a kind of a sales tactic here, I like to, reduce this down to say, no, look, you just need the request handler subclass up here. Whatever the subclass of the request handler is, game handler with your response method, one method, you know, whatever your response is gonna be, that's your business. We're gonna take care of the rest for you. And that's how, you know, that point our customer slash customizer can say, wow, okay, well, that's really easy to, to do then. Thanks. Here's a bunch of money for you. So how are we going to do that? So this is strategy three here. We're going to use a technology called reflection. And so I'm going to ask everybody to follow this link called notes on reflection. Okay, and um, so let's talk a little bit about reflection now. So reflection is a technology that was introduced into Java, I think uh, Java 3.0, maybe something like that, or maybe it was 5.0, I can't quite remember. Okay, and, um, and it was inspired 
my, let's see, I don't want to get into this too deeply here because uh, this is also going to be like pods. We're going to have our own little sort of thing like this. Um, let's see what to say. Okay, so everybody can see my, um, my Chrome here. And then maybe you have this too. So up here you see this NP, it says Netflix Party. Okay, so that is a plugin that I downloaded and it allows me to, uh, you know, watch a Netflix movie with friends or family members who are in, you know, other places remotely. You know, and it, I don't know, it synchronizes the movie and it has like a little chat service. It's like pretty easy. And the way that I got that was I downloaded it from the company that provides it. It wasn't Netflix, I think it's just some other company. I just, uh, you know, I just clicked a button, install, you know, and boom, that little NP appeared up there and now, you know, I have it. But if you think about plug-in technology, it's really kind of amazing, right? I didn't have to download a, uh, a new Chrome with Netflix Party built into it. It's the same Chrome instance that, you know, I've been running for, you know, at least a year now, right? Uh, this was a plug-in. Right, and, and the guys at Google who built Chrome, when they created Chrome, they didn't know about Netflix plugin. Okay, Netflix party plugin. They didn't know about it. I mean, had they known about it, maybe they would have had some kind of a discussion like, uh, oh, you know, this would be like a good feature to have for Chrome. Uh, let's write a bunch of code, you know, to, uh, you know, to add this feature. But they didn't do that because they didn't know about this plugin. Okay? Instead, what they had to do is they had to write code that said, if somebody adds some kind of a plugin at some later date, we've got to have our code, in this case, Google Chrome, have a conversation with this plugin. The conversation would go something like this What services do you provide? What services do you require? And then, okay, now that we know what services you provide, what services you require, we're going to hook you up. We're going to we're going to integrate you into the service. This is not programmers having this discussion with the plugin. This is the program having the discussion with the plugin. And the story goes that um, that you know, one of the first one of the first pieces of software to have this something like plug-in technology uh, was uh, Visual Basic, uh, which is, of course, a Microsoft product, and very competitive with Sun Microsystems. It was doing Java, so they ran to the president of Java and said, oh my God, you know, look at this, look at this, uh, you know, look at this Visual Basic, Basic has this plug-in feature. We've got to have this too. And that's what, for motivated reflection in Java. And we're going to talk more about plugins and so forth. And we're going to develop our own plugin container called Pods later on. So that's the um, that's the motivation. I'll probably repeat that at some later day. Uh, here is the object class. Okay, I remember this is the base class for everything in Java. And, and in it, I've listed like all of the methods that every object inherits. Here's clone equals two string. Remember notify and wait. Uh, we use that in our, uh, where did we use that? In that, in that thread demo, we had producers and consumers of a bank account, shared bank account, and the consumer, if there wasn't enough money, called wait, and then the producer, when and that caused the consumer to block until money showed up. And then the producer, after he put money in, he called notify, which woke up the uh, consumer um, so they could then get the money that was put in there. Here's hash code. And then here in boldface is the one I want to talk about, get class. Now get class returns the class that this object belongs to, that this object is an instance of. And if you think about that, that's a little bit mind-boggling. 
classes don't exist at runtime. Classes exist at compile time. Classes are something that you programmers declare. You create these classes. But at runtime, instances of these classes, objects exist, not the classes. So how could you ask an object, uh, how could you call, ask the object, what class are you an instance of? What would it return? Notice here it returns something of type class. What is that? Well, here's the mind bending part. Uh, these are objects that represent classes. So we have objects that represent classes, and, and that's a little weird to think about. It's very meta. Um, but, you know, the way I'm comfortable with it is I think, well, in object oriented programming, we have objects representing all kinds of crazy things, you know, uh, you know horses, boats, houses, cats, planets, and so forth. Why not have objects representing classes? Here is the class class. Look, it literally says class class. Okay, it's a generic class where T is the actual class that this class represents. And then look at some of the methods here. For example, well, here's start out simple. Here is get name. Hey, what's the name of this class? Here is get super class. What class does this inherit from? And things get a little bit crazier here. here look, here's get fields. Get fields returns an array of fields. What is field? Field, those are objects representing the fields of a class. And then look down here, get methods. This returns an array of objects representing methods. So, so we're really, this is like really kind of uh, outrageous. We've got not only objects representing classes, we have objects representing fields and methods. Okay, so using these methods, you know, if you have like a, an object, and by you, I mean if you are the Chrome browser and somebody drops an object into you, a plugin, you can use these methods to tease that object apart, to find out everything you need to know about that object. You can do surgery. Uh, you're going to write code that sort of does surgery on like a random object. I'm going to show you that code in a minute. Here's a little class diagram. So uh, we have uh, the object class. Class is an object, a subclass of object, and every object has a reference to the class that it instantiates. Method and field are also subclasses of object. All right, so I'm gonna take a two minute, two or three minute break here, just because I read somewhere that you should, um, you should do that when you're doing um, Zoom lectures. Uh, and we come back, what I'd like you to do while, um, while we're on break here, and you can do it when we get back to, is uh, I'd like you to create a package called, uh, what is this package called? Reflection Demos, okay, in Eclipse or IntelliJ. Uh, and that package could be in like, maybe you just have some demos project, or you could start a new project. And this note.java and reflection demos.java, those should be uh, loaded into uh, that into that package. And then uh, when we come back, um, we'll talk about that. Um, so I am going to pause the recording here for a moment. Recording, please. Good. I am going to jump over to um, Clips. Hopefully, you've had time to uh, to <clears throat> download um, these programs. And here I've got reflection demos. I've got a little demos project here where I just dump stuff that I'm playing around with. And uh, this universal dot Java is just another experiment that failed. Um, and failure is a good thing, right? I encourage you to experiment around, try things out, you know, 
find out what doesn't work, why didn't work, and so forth. Learn as much from failure as you do from success, maybe more. Let's take a look at Note.java. So uh, this is a little class hierarchy I've created uh, for representing musical notes. So here is my note class. The note has these two public fields, frequency and duration of a note. Right? The frequency would be like the pitch, I suppose. Duration would be, well, like, you know, is it a half note, a whole note, that sort of thing. And then it's got a play method, and the play method just prints out the playing a generic note message. Horn note extends notes, so it's a subclass of notes, okay, and it overrides the play method so that it prints out playing a horn note. Violin note also extends note and also overrides play, but it prints out playing a violin note. So not a very complicated class hierarchy. Okay, so we're just going to use that for demo purposes. And if you go back and look at the notes, you'll see a little class diagram there. But... Okay, so reflection demo. So, um, reflection demos, first of all, um, some of this stuff, most of the stuff in for reflection is in this sub package called reflect inside of java.lang. So usually you need that for some of it. And, and the first thing I'm going to demonstrate to you is what used to be called RTTI back in the old days. RTTI stands for runtime type information. Runtime type information. Um, this was the C++ term. C++ had this sort of very lame uh, RTTI feature in it. Um, so, uh, so uh, here I've got this uh, public static method get types, which is demonstrating this. Get types takes as an input any kind of an object at all. I have no information about this object, and then begin by calling object dot get class. So that was that method that we just saw in uh, in the object class. Object dot get class, and this is going to return a class, and then remember it's a generic class. So here, you know, we should put in like node or horn node or something like that. But the point is here, we don't know what kind of a class this is. We don't know what the underlying class is. So we put in a question mark here and that's okay. It just means, well, it's some kind of a class, a class of something, but we don't know exactly what it is. Okay, and so now, uh, while C is not equal to null, I'm going to print out C.getName. Remember, get name is uh, what's the name of the class? Okay, I'll put a little tab in front of it here just for formatting purposes. And then I'm going to redefine C here. C equals C.getSuperClass. So basically, we're going to climb up the class hierarchy starting at some, you know, whatever class it instantiates, what's its superclass, what's the superclass of the superclass, the super, super, superclass, and so forth. And finally, when we get to the object class, so if C is an object representing the object class, get superclass returns null, and that's what's going to get us out of the loop. Okay, so let's come down to main here. And here, main, I've declared a variable of type note. And then what I've done is I've stuffed it with a violin note. And now that's a, um, keep reminding you of this. Hope you're not getting too sick of it, but that's polymorphism right there. Okay, um, violin note has many types. Polymorphism means many types. Objects can have many types. A violin note, is has type violin note, it has type note, and it also has type object. So three different types. And what that means here is that I was expecting a note to be stuffed in here because it's a variable of type note, but you stuffed in a violin note and that's okay. We sometimes uh, the way that we say that is that a violin note can masquerade as a note. And then I'll pass note in to get types. And then I'm going to repeat the experiment, but this time 
with horn note. Where can I get the source code for the reflecting demos? Let's go back to here. Uh, there's our note.java. So hopefully we are in um, how far back we need to go here, but this is the echo project. Come down the echo project. Notes on reflection. And then scroll down notes on reflection. And there's reflection demos.java. And there's note.java. Those are the classes that you need. Um, okay, yes. Okay. Um, all right. So then I call get types of note, and then I change my mind and I stuff in note a horn note. Same thing, polymorphism. It's cool. And I call get types of note again. So let's run this guy. Okay. And here we see printing out the names. Notice it prints out the qualified name. The qualified name. You know, I think of reflection demos as the the surname and violin note is the given name, or the family name and the given name. So violin note belongs to the reflection demos package, a package dot, dot class. And then uh, its super class is note, and its super class is super class is object. And here we see now it says horn note. Super class note, super, super class object. And there's nothing above that, so it quits. Okay. We can find out, we can get information about what types or class has in this way. Next, introspection, this is called. Okay. Um, so, what does introspection mean, right? Uh, you probably know introspective people. Who are these people? These are people who, uh, you know, are really in touch with their feelings, with their emotions, you know, with their sort of uh, psychological patterns and so forth. You know, they they think about these things. These are people who are never very much fun at parties because they're always depressed. Uh, so Java objects are these people. Java objects are introspective, so they know what's going on inside of them, right? They can provide you with this uh, kind of meta information. And, and, uh, and so get members is going to show us this. It takes as its input any object at all. And then we start out like we did before. Let's get the class of that object. It's a class of um, I don't know. Okay, and now here I'm going to call c.get methods, and this returns this array of methods for us. And I'm going to loop through this array, and I'm going to print out the name of each method. Now here I'm just getting so get name is a member of the method class. So there's a method class, objects representing methods. And if you have a method object, I mean, you can not only get its name, I could also get uh, its parameters, its return type, its parameter types, a list of the exceptions that it throws. You can get all of this stuff for you. Okay, and I mean, you might be like, I don't know, this might, might be finding this a little irritating. Well, why do I need to do this? I can just look at the class and tell you what the methods are because you're not there, right? This is, this is being, this is in code. This is like, this is like a plugin. This object here is a plugin that somebody has dropped into our code, you know, long after we've released it into the world. So, so we can't look at this stuff. We have to write code that looks at this stuff. And then, I'll call c.get fields, and this returns an array of objects representing the fields of the class. And I'm going to iterate through this array, and for each one, I'm going to get the name of the field, 
And then this is kind of cool. Uh, here, I'm gonna get, here I'm gonna get the, I'm gonna get the value of the field, right? So, so get here, this is like uh, basically, object dot field but objects the thing that goes before the dot here is now the explicit inputs to get and and the uh, you know this it's almost like i'm saying field dot object rather than object dot field so here's the field dot and then get the value of that field and here's the object that we're uh, referring to Now, you might be saying, wow, well, doesn't this you know, violate all kinds of uh, security? Basically, what I'm doing here is I'm plopping an object into this method, and then, uh, and then I'm doing a kind of surgery on this object. I'm telling you all about what's in the object. And, and yes, your fears are justified. Uh, there are ways to violating security uh, using reflection. Uh, I will say, though, that if the field is declared private, then this thing returns null. It prints out as blank. Okay, so let's try it here. Um, so, um, We'll create a horn note, a uh, violin note, sorry. We'll get the members of that note. And then, um, yeah, so I think that'll be sufficient. So I'm creating a, horn, a violin note, and I'm passing it in to get members. Okay, so here we have, there's the play method. I remember a violin note had a play method. There are actually three variations of the way, these are all methods inherited from the object class. Okay, uh, the wait method, there are actually three variants of it, equals, two string, hash code, get class, notify, notify all. And then here are the fields. Remember there were two fields, frequency, which was 60, and duration, which was 300 the frequency and duration of the note. Okay. Let's go on to the next thing. So I call this dynamic invocation. Um, <clears throat> So here it's not a random object, but it's an object of type note, some kind of a note, maybe a generic note, maybe a horn note, maybe a violin note, some other kind of note, I don't know. And I'm going to call note.getClass, and this is gonna give me an object representing what class does that note instantiate? Is it a horn note, is it a violin note, something else? Now I have this array uh, arg types here, which is an array of class and arg values, which is an array of objects, which are both null right now. So here's c.get method. I wanna get a method. Which method do I wanna get? I wanna get the method named play, okay? Uh, there could be multiple methods called play, Remember overloading, you're gonna have name sharing among object, among methods. So maybe there's 10 different play methods, which one do you want? Well, you can overload play, but each one has to have different types of parameters, inputs to it. And so that's what arg types is. Arg types is an array of classes. So for example, maybe there's like a variant of play that takes two inputs, a Boolean and a double. What are those inputs for? I don't know, just make something up. Then here, our types would be an array of classes, two classes, the class representing Boolean and the class representing double. And that would pinpoint which play I was talking about. The play I'm talking about has no inputs to it. 
right? So that's why this is null. So now I've got the method, and then here's where things get really crazy. I'm going to invoke the method. Okay, so that would be like note.play, but instead it's more like more like this, play.note, because the method that's play, and I'm invoking that method. And then it wants to know, well, what's the implicit parameter? Remember implicit parameter, that's the guy that goes on the outside. Explicit parameters are what go on the inside of the parentheses. Implicit parameter, this goes on the outside. So what's the implicit parameter? That's note. And then what are the explicit parameters? What goes inside the parentheses? Those are the arg values. That's an array of objects. But since the parentheses are empty, I've just set that equal to null. So again, you might be saying, well, why are you making me do this? Why can't I just write note.play? And again, because you're not there to write this code. This is this code is right. This is code that writes the code, code that writes itself. Okay, so uh, so we're we are getting the class of the notes, and then we're getting the play method. And this is all code that is being written by, performed by your program after it's already been delivered out in the, uh, out in the world there somewhere. So let's come back down to main and see if we can do that. So here I'm going to do play a note. And then here I will redefine note to be a horn note. And then we'll play that note again. We call play notes twice, but note has changed in between. Okay. This is the output produced by pl the play of violin note. And this is the output produced by playing a horn note. Okay. Finally, sort of the ultimate here, I call this dynamic instantiation. So this is again play. Up here, this play said, give me a note and I'll play it for you. This play says, give me the kind of note that you want to play, violin note, horn note, and so forth, but give it to me just as a string. What's the name of the type of note that you'd like me to play? Okay. This is the, this is what we're going to be using in Echo this version. So no type is just a string or no. Okay, so class is a static method called for name. It takes a string as an input, which is the name of some class. What it does is it finds that class, it searches the class path for a class with that name. And then it loads it into the virtual machine, the Java VM. It loads it into the Java VM and it returns an object representing that class that it just loaded. Okay, I'm going to say that again. So for name is static. Here, this is the class class. It's static. And it takes as its input the qualified name of some class. It searches your class path looking for a dot class file with that name. So maybe this name is, you know, violin note dot class. It's looking for that. When it finds it, throws an exception if it doesn't find it. When it finds it, it loads that into your Java virtual machine that's running. Okay, and it returns an object representing the class that it just loaded. 
class of what? I don't know, question mark there. Next, I'm going to use that class. I'm going to create a new instance of this class. So I can actually use the class to create instances of the class. Now, here, I'm assuming that this is some sort of a note, so I'm going to cast it as a note. And so now I've got the note object. I'm going to pass that note object up to this play method, which you know will dissect it and find its play method and invoke it. Okay, so here, let's comment at this. Might as well comment out this stuff up here too. I don't need any of this. Okay, so play, I'm giving it a string. Here's the qualified name, reflection demos dot horn notes. And I'm going to play that and then I'll do the same for violin note. There's the horn note playing, isn't it beautiful? And there's the violin note playing. All of that just from the name of the class. That's all I really needed. Okay, so hopefully you can get some sense of like how all of this stuff would be useful with a plugin. I mean, just from the name of the plugin class, you know, the container app, you know, Chrome, for example, maybe the the name of the class is Netflix Party in Chrome. Then from that name, loads the class, uh, creates a new instance of it, finds out what methods it has, and then invokes those methods. So this is like the essence of like how plugins work. And what I'm hoping uh, that we'll get to is pods is our little plugin container that we're going to create so that you know. We can do exactly the same thing that Chrome does. Okay. So, why did we take this little diversion? Let's go back to Echo now. Okay, so my plan for Echo, let's look at the code for Echo, server.java. When you create a server, you're going to give it two pieces of information. What port should it be listening at? Okay, and then the name of the kind of request handler it should be making. Okay, and then uh, up here, notice handler type is a class of question mark. Some kind of that's the class object. And here in the constructor, I'm going to initialize this type handler type with a class dot forename of handler type. So this is going to search the class path, whatever the name of the type of handler. Maybe this could be request handler or math handler. I'm sorry. Is that right? Yeah, request handler, math handler, game handler whatever the name is, okay? And this will load the class and it will return an object, class object representing the class, and I'm going to save it in handler type here. And then down here, we're listening, accept a connection from the client, and here we're going to make handler. And here's make handler, except by the way, returns a socket connected to the client. And so make handler is going to call make handler here and pass in this socket return by uh, by accept. Okay, it's got to create a new instance of the handler type. Here it's going to set that new handler's uh, sockets to S, and then it's going to return it some kind of a request handler subclass. Right? And then this guy is going to, it's a thread, right? So this guy is going to call its run method or its start method, maybe it's the run method. Okay, and so basically what you've got to do is, is mimic the code that I just showed you for violin notes and horn notes, but now 
instead of making some kind of uh, an instance, some subclass of note, you're making an instance of some subclass of request handler. All right. Here's a request handler, and you know, so for example, math handler. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to uh, before Thursday, I'd like you to get this lab one finished. Right. Um, so lab one is just the is just the echo server with the request handler that just you know mimics back and forth you know whatever the client request is. And so I want you to not only finish the code for lab one but test it. And I did a demo on Thursday of how you run these things, but you know here it is. Uh, here it is again. You know like how you start the server. Uh, you start the client, and once the client started, you know you can start, you know, sending messages to the server. Okay. Questions? Okay. Everybody, um, thinking by the lack of questions, that everybody's good with this. Um, all right, uh, so uh, that's it for me today. Um, there's no office hours today. Remember, the office hours are now Monday through Friday, uh, and um, and you know if you need like a private meeting or something like that, you know, send me an email requesting uh, requesting that. Um, so, Stephen, did you have a question? Mm. So in lab one, are we supposed to create object of handler? Request handler, I assume you mean. And, and you're supposed to be writing the code that does that. Right? So that's the... Uh, right, so here's server, you add this code. And you know these comment lines or commented lines are what you have to what you have to fill in. Those are the blanks you have to fill in, not this wild thing. That's just a regular comment. But this make hand handler is calling this make handler method with the socket returned by accept. Accept is a method of my socket. And so that'll return a socket connected to the client. And then you call make handler and you give this guy a socket. Set the handler socket to S. So that is, let's see. That's a method inherited from, um, from correspondent. Set socket. Okay. And, uh, and so then, uh, and then you return the handler and then the handler gets started here. So, so you are writing the code for creating this handler. And this code that you're writing here is similar to the code that you just saw for me making horn notes and violin notes. I want you to study that. And, and that's how you implement this. And then when you run the thing, You actually run it down here. Right here, I'm starting the server. Here, I'm starting the client. When I start up the client, it talks to the server, and the server creates the handler, right? The server that's the code that we were just looking at. Okay, so is that, is that clear, Stephen? Okay. Um, good. All right. Uh, so I will see everybody on Thursday, hopefully. Um, talk to you soon. Bye-bye.